Luke chapter 17, please. Luke chapter 17. And I see what time it is. It's 1130. Now don't pull out your stopwatches. Don't pull out your clocks. I see the clock right there. And uh, the food, I promise you, won't go anywhere. It's all there. It's going to stay warm. There's some folks that are managing that. And uh, they're, they're preparing it and, and uh, making sure things are ready to go. And so I really appreciate their efforts as well. But uh, none of us will miss the meal. I just want to ask you for the next 30 minutes or so to just focus in on the Word of God. To focus in on what the Bible has to say. This is the most important time of church. Not because I'm preaching, but because of the book I'm preaching. I'm preaching the Bible, the Word of God. And when, God, uh, when, when you hear God's Word... Ask God to speak to your heart. Open your heart and say, Lord, what do you have for me today? I mean, when, when you hear this message, uh, just stop for the next few minutes and say, God, I really want to get something from you today. Would you pray that right now? Would you say, Lord, give me what you have intended for me today? You know, it could be for some of you here, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And what God has for you above all else is that he wants you saved. It could be that you're here and you're a Christian, but you're away from the Lord. Maybe you've been running from the Lord and, and you just need to get back close to your Heavenly Father again. It could be here that uh, your marriage is struggling and you need God to do something in your marriage. It could be that you have some children that uh, you need to raise for God. Whatever it is, God has something for you if you'll open your heart to Him. Luke chapter 17, the title of the message today is this, The Top 10%. The Top 10%. We've just went through an election cycle, and we heard a lot about the top 1%. The top 1% are those uh, who uh, have, make more money than anybody else, the top 1%. So we heard a lot of talk about that. But today I want us to focus, more importantly, on the top 10%. Because actually these are the wealthiest people in the world. The top 1%, uh, nothing against them. I'm glad they, God has blessed them the way they are. But the top 10% are truly the people who have the riches. And I want to ask you this morning, are you part of the top 10%? Say, Pastor, my bank account is, is bone dry. I've got receipts and moths in my wallet, and, and, uh, <laughs> and I don't know what Benjamin Franklin looks like anymore. You know? uh, well, you can still be part of the top 10%. And I want us to see that clearly this morning. Luke chapter, Luke chapter 17, verse 12. The Bible says, And as he, that's Jesus, Entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Let me explain just for a moment who lepers were. Leprosy was a horrible disease. It was a death sentence. Without getting into great detail, uh, leprosy would, would just literally devour your body. And it gave you a grotesque outward appearance. And eventually it would take your life. It was such a bad disease that they had entire leper colonies. If it was discovered you had leprosy, you could no longer live with your family. You could no longer go to school, students. You could no longer uh, live with the rest of the society. You had to live outside of society just with other lepers. That's how bad this disease was. So to receive leprosy, to have leprosy was a death sentence. It, it was a disfiguring. It was a horrible disease. And here are these ten men who are lepers. Notice they stood afar off. Lepers were not allowed to approach anyone who is clean. In fact, if they saw someone walking towards them, they'd have to cover their face like this, and they'd have to yell out, Unclean! Unclean! So that person wouldn't come near and get the disease as well. And so they stood afar off, verse 13, but they saw Jesus. By the way, folks, no matter what disease you have, no matter what sin, trouble you have, no matter what burden you have, the key, the person you need to go to is Jesus Christ. If it's a struggle in your marriage, you need to go to Jesus Christ. If it's a struggle with your finances or with an addiction or not knowing for sure you're saved, Jesus doesn't just have the answer. Jesus is the answer. And here the lepers, they saw Jesus and they recognized who He was and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when He saw them, He said unto them, Go, show yourselves unto the priests. Now what that meant was this. When a person believed that they were cleansed, they would have to go show themselves to the priest and the priest would declare them clean. And He said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. 
Just imagine, this, they, they've been walking with a disease, with a death sentence, and they meet Jesus, and Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. And as they're walking, they look down, and that hand that was covered with uh, lumps, and that, uh, parts of the hand were falling away, they look down, and all of a sudden, their hand is like a baby's hand again. And they touch their face, and where there used to be scars and, and wounds and open sores, they touch their face, and their flesh is whole again. They're saved. They're cleansed. They can return to normal life again. They've been delivered. They were cleansed. Verse 15. And one of them, verse 15, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. One leper who was healed, one leper who was saved, when he saw that he was healed, he returned to Jesus Christ. And he fell on his face and he gave him thanks. Notice, and he was a Samaritan. We talked last week about the Samaritans. The Samaritans were half-breed Jews. The Jews hated Samaritans. Samaritans hated Jews. But here's a man who's a Samaritan realizing that Jesus is the Savior for the whole world. And when he comes to Jesus, he gets healed. And he said, listen, I can't just go on my way like I haven't been healed. I can't just go live the rest of my life without returning thanks to the one who saved me. I can't just live the rest of my life without giving some glory to the person who delivered me. So he turns around, he falls on his face, and he gave him thanks. Now listen to what Jesus asked, verse 17. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Let's pray. Lord, fill me with your spirit as I preach your word. God, may every heart be open to your word this morning. Help us, Lord, to receive what you have for us. If there's someone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior... May they trust you today. We love you, Lord. Thank you for saving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's ten men with a death sentence. All ten are healed. How many got healed? We're going to make this interactive this morning. How many got healed? Ten. Well, let me ask again. How many got healed? Ten. Ten got healed. How many returned to give thanks? One. That's ten percent. That's one out of ten. That's ten percent. Out of... Ten who got healed, ten who've been delivered, one person out of ten came back and said, Jesus, thank you. One. Folks, I wonder, are you part of the top ten percent this morning? See, that Samaritan man, he, even though he was a leper who had been healed, even though he was a Samaritan, he said, you know what? I realize what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for me, and so I'm going to turn around and I'm going to give him thanks. But unfortunately, out of that ten, only one returned. Only ten percent Return, and he is that top 10%. I want to say this morning that grateful people are the top 10%. Grateful people are truly the richest people in the world. I don't care how much money you have in your account. I don't care uh, how many cars you drive and how big your house may be or, or what kind of clothes you wear. I'm telling you this morning that if you're a grateful person, you're part of the top 10%. Only one out of 10 returned and said, Jesus, Thank you for what you've done for me. The other nine just went on their way like nothing had happened. Christian, are you part of the top 10% this morning? If you had been one of those lepers, would you been, have been one of the nine who just said, Well, hey, I'm healed now. Good. And you just went on your way and never returned to give thanks to Jesus Christ. Or would you be that man who said, I owe everything to you, Lord. And so, Lord, I'm returning to give you glory. I'm returning to give you praise. I'm returning to give you thanks. I want to look very briefly this morning at the difference between grateful people and ungrateful people. I think most of us in our minds, we might think, hey, I'm a, I'm a grateful person. I, I am part of that top 10%. But I want us to examine our own hearts today. And I want the Holy Spirit of God to open our hearts today and look inside of us and show us, are we part of that top 10% who give God thanks? Are we, top, are we part of that top 10% who are truly grateful? I want to list a few things here. Number one, grateful people. Grateful people are thankful for what they have. Grateful people are thankful for what they have. Ungrateful people believe they deserve more than they have. Grateful people are thankful for what they have, but ungrateful people believe they deserve more than what they have. You've heard people say, boy, God, he ought to just give me what I deserve. Folks, don't ever pray that. 
If God gives us what we deserve, we'd be lost and on our way to a devil's hell. God has been far better to us than we deserve. I like it. I heard a man the other day, somebody said, how are you doing? He said, better than I deserve. I'm better than I deserve. Folks, grateful people are thankful for what they have. Ungrateful people believe they deserve more. Secondly, grateful people are humble people. Ungrateful people are proud people. Grateful people realize that all they have is a gift from God and they're humble. They're, they can't believe God has been so good to them. Ungrateful people expect more. They expect that they should have the very best. Number three, grateful people seek to be a blessing to other people. Ungrateful people wonder why more people don't bless them. Grateful people are always looking for a way to be a blessing to someone else. Ungrateful people are wondering why nobody else is being a blessing to them. Let, let me apply it very in, in a kind of a different way. It, it's interesting. You go to a church sometime and somebody will go to church and they'll say, you know what, nobody at church today shook my hand. Nobody at church today shook my hand. Folks, you know what that really means? It really means you didn't shake anybody's hand. That's what it really means. Say, Pastor, nobody at church today came and encouraged me. Here's the question. Who did you come and encourage at church? Hey, nobody at church was friendly to me. Who did you, who were you friendly to at church? See, the fact is, grateful people are always seeking to be a blessing to other people, whereas ungrateful people are always wondering why more people don't bless them. Ungrateful people are looking for self-gratification. By the way, it's true in a marriage. A grateful marriage partner is seeking to be a blessing to their spouse. A grateful marriage partner, a husband or a wife who's grateful to have a spouse, they're seeking for the ways to make their spouse's life better. Whereas an ungrateful spouse is always wondering why their spouse doesn't do more for them. Number four, grateful people realize that giving more brings blessing. Jesus himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. And grateful people are generous people. But number four, also, ungrateful people believe that getting more will make them happy. Grateful people are always looking for a way to give more. Ungrateful people are always looking to take more. Ask yourself this morning, am I a giver or a taker? If you find yourself to be always a taker, it could be that you're an ungrateful person. Folks, Bob Jones Sr. used to say that when gratitude dies on the altar of a man's heart, that man is well nigh hopeless. Folks, are you always looking for what you can do for someone else, or are you always waiting for somebody to do for you? You'll find the most miserable people in the world are not people who have less money, not people who have less things. The most miserable people in the world are the people who are wrapped up in, them, in themselves. A man wrapped up in himself makes a very small package. And if you're always waiting for somebody else to do something for you to fulfill your happiness, folks, you're going to be sorely disappointed in this life. Realize that giving brings more blessing. Again, that applies in every relationship. That applies with your marriage. That applies in your home. That applies at your workplace. Doing for other people will bring you the satisfaction that getting more things won't. Number five, grateful people are content people. Let's look at Philippians for a moment. Look at Philippians chapter 4, please. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse number 10. Grateful people are content people. Uh, grateful people are marked by contentment, whereas ungrateful people are marked by resentment. Grateful people are content with what God has done for them. Now let me say this, grateful people are not content with what they've done for God. They realize that all that God has done for them is just an amazing blessing, but they are not content with what they've done for God. Whereas ungrateful people, instead of being marked with contentment, they're marked by resentment. They believe they have certain rights in their marriage. You know, I've heard people say with marriage, marriage is 50-50, folks. Marriage is not 50-50. Let me say again, marriage is not 50-50. Marriage is 100% no matter what the other side gives. That's what marriage is. Say, well, I can only give 100% if they give 100%. Can I tell you something then? You're going to be sorely disappointed. There's not one person who is able to fulfill 
all of the all of the wants and desires and needs and and everything that the other spouse wants folks there are no perfect people except one that's Jesus Christ who walked on water who came to die for our sins we live in a fallen world we live in a world where things aren't perfect and if you're a grateful person you'll learn to be content with the spouse God's given you. You'll learn to be content with the place in life God's given you and the, the good things God's given you. Whereas if you're an ungrateful person, you'll find instead of contentment, you'll find resentment. When other people fail you, and can I tell you something? Other people will fail you. Can I give us a wake-up call, though? We've failed a whole bunch of other people. <laughs> Well, they, they haven't been everything for me I need them to be. Have you been everything for them that you need to be? The fact is that when we're grateful, we're contented. And if we're ungrateful, we're resentful. We believe that others have failed to live up to what we deserve in our lives, folks. We don't deserve anything except for a devil's hell. But God loved us and sent Jesus for us. Look at Philippians 4. Here's Paul. I want to remind you where Paul is. Paul is in prison when he writes this. And he's in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's in prison for taking a stand for the Lord. And notice what he says, Philippians 4.10. The church at Philippi, that's the name Philippians, the church at Philippi had sent some money to Paul to help him while he was in prison. And notice what Paul says, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you are also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. He said, you would have helped me before, but you couldn't. I understand. Verse 11, he says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. Paul, what have you learned? He said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul, why do you have to learn that? Because I didn't know, always know how to be content. In fact, I found myself complaining and resentful, but I had to learn to be content. Well, Paul, are you content when everything's hunky-dory? You all know that's a fancy word, right? How many of you know that word, what that means? It means when everything's just right. Paul, are you content when all the bills are paid and there's no sickness and there's no trouble? Is that when you're content? Paul said, yeah, well, of course, I, I'm content when it's like that. He said, but I'm also content when things are the opposite. Look at verse 12. He said, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I had an older wise preacher tell me one time, he said, Tim, I'm going to tell you something. I want to help you. He said, there's never been a point in my ministry. Don't miss this. He said, there's never been a point in my ministry where I felt that I had everything that I needed. You know, here's the truth. In this life, we always feel like we need a little bit more, don't we? Um, we, we just feel like we need a little bit more. Uh, get the person who is, uh, has, God's really blessed them financially, they get a million dollars. You know what they need now? They need another million. Uh, well, uh, Get that person that, boy, they, they, got a, they, they worked and hard and they saved. And they got a house. Finally, they got a house. You know what they need now? A bigger house. A better house. How many of you have ever just really spent some money on something you just had to have and about two months later the newer version came out and you went, you know what, I really need one of those. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, I, I, man, I've got to have this thing. And then two, three months later you went to somebody else's house. That was your mistake. And you walked in and they had a better thing. And you went, man, I need that thing instead of the one I have. By the way, we, we, we kid, I, I've told you before many a time what I do with our kids each year. And, and what kids do, what I used to do. They'll go when the, the newspaper ads come out, especially this week, uh, right before Black Friday. Boy, the, the ads are, you know, they're thick in that newspaper. Kids will get all those newspaper ads out. They'll start opening them up. They'll get their markers out and circle stuff. You know, they might as well just put the whole paper on the floor and circle the whole paper. They just want everything in there. I want it all. But don't we all? We want it all, don't we? We want to have our cake and eat it too. And you know what I usually tell my kids? You know how much of that you're getting? <laughs> You're getting whatever I found on clearance at Meyer and Walmart and all that. You know, that's what you're getting. Uh, but, but truly, we need to teach our children to be content. Because, I, and I, I try to teach them this. Listen, you don't outgrow that when, just because you're older. It, your toys just get bigger. 
You go, you know, well, I really need this car. And I'm not, I'm not downing somebody getting a new car. That's a blessing. That's wonderful. Well, I really need this house. I'm simply saying, ask yourself realistically, am I truly content with what God's given me? The greatest way to be the richest person in the world is not to get everything you want, but it's to want everything you have. The truth is you're going to keep wanting new stuff. And it's important to learn to be content, not only with the things you have, but with the people God has put into your life. Be content. Notice what Paul said. He said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Look at verse 17. He says, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. Wait a minute, Paul. Do you know you're still in prison? Yeah, I know. Paul, what do you mean you have all? I mean, the, when you look at what Paul's earthly possessions were, he had a cloak and he had some books and he had some parchments. But Paul said, I have all. Why? Because Paul said, I, I want what I have. I'm thankful for the place God's put me in life. Folks, gratitude is a spiritual discipline. We must learn to be that top 10% and be grateful, not to be resentful, but to be content with what God has given us. Paul said, I have all and abound. I am full. Number six, grateful people express their gratitude with thankful words. So I'm grateful in my heart. You need to express that gratitude. You need to tell your spouse you appreciate something they do. And be specific. You need to tell your children you appreciate them. You need to tell your friends and your loved ones now what you will say one day when they're gone. Don't wait until they're gone and until you're eulogizing them. No, say right now the things you would say then. Send the flowers now. Send the thank you note now. Say I love you now. Thankful words. I had a friend in college, a good friend, great big beast of a man. Kind of like me, but no, not really. <laughs> like some other guys here. And uh, 300 pounds, football player, played on the line, you know, like some of you guys here. And... Uh, we were just talking. We were friends. And uh, he, he said, yeah, I've never told my dad I love him. He said, we just don't do that. And I, I won't say his name. I said, I said, man, you need to tell your dad you love him. He said, oh, no, we just don't do that. I mean, you know, dad's strong, tough guy. His dad was a brick mason. I, sh I met his dad one time. shook his dad's hand. His hand felt like a brick. I mean, it was dry and hard and big. And, and he, he was a big guy himself. He said, we don't do that. I said, man, you really need to pray. I said, do this. Pray about it. You need to tell your dad you love him. He ended up doing that, and they began to express their love to each other. And within a couple of years, his dad passed away of a heart attack. What am I saying? I'm saying say the words now that you'll wish you had said then. Don't wait until you've lost what God's given you, the people God's put in your path. Use thankful words now. Grateful people use thankful words. Ungrateful people use complaining words. Words about uh, what, what has not been done for them. Instead of looking at your life and saying, boy, I wish people, yeah, they did this, but they could have done this and this and this. How about, I'm thankful for what my parents, teens, have done for me. Are your parents perfect? No, and neither are you. Well, mom and dad, they don't give me the best shoes. Did they give you shoes? I don't like what mom, mom made for dinner. Did you actually get something to eat this week? I, I'm, I'm just saying, did you eat this week? Well, my parents drive an old rust bucket. I'm embarrassed to go to school with my parents. Oh, you mean your parents had a car? And they gave you a ride to school? Well, it sounds like you've got it pretty good to me. Hey, teens... Don't wait until your parents are gone. Say, I know it's awkward. I'm a teenager. Teens don't tell their parents stuff like this. You need to. You need to sit down maybe today. Write a thank you note to your parents. Say, yeah, but my parents got issues. So do you. So does every person you know. Instead of focusing on what hasn't been done for you, could you find some thankful words, some grateful words, and express that gratitude? The top 10% are grateful people. And grateful people use thankful words. They express their gratitude. Number seven, grateful people are specific. And they value people more than things. Ungrateful people value things more than people. Let me say again, grateful people value 
people and they're specific. Mom, thank you for making my lunch. Dad, thank you for shooting ball with me. Can I tell you something? Let me remind you of something. As bad as you think you have it, whoever you may be, and I don't know who I'm talking to, but your life is a dream world to somebody else. There are thousands, yea, millions of people in this world who would trade places with you at the drop of a hat. If they could have your life and you could have theirs, they'd trade with you right now. Folks, God has been far better to us than we realize. The problem is not that God hasn't been good to us. It's that many times we miss how good God's been because we're not focused on it. Number eight, that brings me to this. Grateful people focus on their blessings, whereas ungrateful people focus on their troubles. All of us have troubles. All of us. All of us have burdens. Every one of us could stand up here and get behind this microphone and list our troubles by the hour. Every person here. And our troubles are different. And they're real. And the burdens are real. But folks, if we were aware like we should be, we could also stand up here by the hour. We're going to get a chance by the minute in the gym in a little bit. But we could also get up here and talk about how good God's been to us. We could talk about all the great things God has done for us. Number one, you live in America. We live in America. We live in the freest nation on the earth. Yeah, but America's got problems. That means you live in America. So I said, I got so mad at God. Why did my tire have to go flat? Wait a minute. You have a car? Oh, you're really blessed. Well, I, I'm so mad. Uh, my, 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 my child, I had a doctor bill again. Wait a minute. You have a child? You're blessed. Well, my husband, I'm so mad at him. He comes home and he sits on the couch when he comes home from work. No ladies don't say amen right now. <laughs> I see some elbows about to fly right now. He sits on the couch. You know what that means? It means he's home with you. You know, the fact is that we can always focus on our troubles. They're, they're, they're a dime a dozen. It doesn't take any skill to focus on trouble. It doesn't take any skill to complain. It takes none at all. But to focus on our blessings... That takes gratitude and spiritual discipline. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're almost done. Let's look at this passage, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. The Bible says, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Well, no, wait, Pastor, that means all the good stuff. No, it says in everything. Well, Pastor, how can I give thanks for the tough times of life? By seeing the good that God brought out of the tough time. I've told you the story before about the man named Barry Austin who was smitten with Lou Gehrig's disease. Barry Austin, before he got Lou Gehrig's disease, he was lost on his way to a devil's hell. He didn't care about God. He didn't care about what the Word of God had to say. But Lou Gehrig's disease was a blessing in Barry Austin's life. Why? Because it humbled him and it caused him to focus on eternity. And Barry got saved. I've heard people whose parents have developed cancer later in life. Their parents lived a great long life and then their parents get cancer and I've, I've heard people say, God, I'm mad at you. Can I tell you that maybe that cancer was actually a gift from God? To say, you know what? The time's nearing. You need to say the things you want to say. You want to express your love now. Because the time is coming close. Folks, what I'm saying is in every situation, whether it be something we would choose or something we wouldn't choose in life, we have to decide whether we're going to focus on the trouble or we're going to focus on the blessings. The Bible says, in everything give thanks. Why? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do you believe God has your best interest at heart, child of God? Do you believe Jeremiah 29, 11? I was reminded of that verse again this week. I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Do you believe that? I believe that. God wants the best for us. What that means then is this. When a tough time, a difficult thing that we wouldn't choose comes into our life, it means that it first passed through the hands of our loving Heavenly Father. God didn't tell us we had to understand. He just wants us to trust Him. Focus on the blessings, not on the trouble. Paul, who wrote, in everything give thanks, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7b, 
He talks about a thorn he had in his flesh. We don't know what it was. Some people say it was crippling arthritis, just intense pain every day. Some people say it was just a horrible eyesight. Whatever it was, it was something that was so bad, it was a distraction to Paul. And he begged God. He said, Lord, please deliver me from this. God, please heal me from this. Could God have delivered him from that? Could God have healed him? Yes. But three times God told him no. God said, Paul... My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul said, all right, Lord. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He said, therefore, I take pleasure in persecutions and necessities, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Grateful people focus on their blessings, not on their trouble. Grateful people communicate their thanks. Ungrateful people wish someone would thank them. Folks, don't live your whole life waiting for somebody to thank you, waiting for somebody to bless you. How about you go out of your way to thank somebody? How about you go out of your way to bless somebody? I promise you, you'll find much more fulfillment in life. And then last of all, number 10, grateful people realize that life itself and all the good things in life are blessings and gifts from God. Ungrateful people believe that God owes them everything. Some people complain because God puts thorns on roses. Other people praise God for putting roses in thorns. See, it's all in how you look at it. I like Matthew Henry. He was a commentator from the 19th century. He was robbed and he was reflecting on his experience. He wrote this in his diary. He said, let me be thankful first because I was never robbed before. Second, because although they took my wallet, they didn't take my life. Third, because although they took everything I had, it wasn't much. And fourth, because I was the one who was robbed, I was not the one who was robbing. More gratitude doesn't come from our acquisitions, but from more awareness of God's goodness and God's presence. We're going to be done with this. Look at Psalm 103, please. Grateful people realize that life itself is a gift. You know, for many of us in here who have lost loved ones, who loved ones have gone on to heaven already, in that moment when you lost that loved one, maybe you questioned God. and You said, Lord, how could you do this? Lord, if you're good, how could you do this? But here's the truth. What if God had never given you that person in the first place? What if you had never known that love that you had? The truth is that every bit of life we have, everything we have in life is a gift from God. Psalm 103, verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. That's the key. That's why we have thanksgiving. It's easy to forget His benefits. Verse 3, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. If you're saved, you're a child of God, you know how much of your sin God's forgiven you for? All of it. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Wait a minute, Pastor. My loved one died of cancer. How did God heal their diseases? If they're saved, they went to an eternity with the Lord. And by the way, God's Word says we have a new body. We have a, a perfect place a called home where there's no more sickness, no more death, no more crying. That's the heaven that Jesus has prepared. That's the heaven. Heaven's not on this earth. Don't try to make your heaven on this earth because it won't happen. Heaven is to come and eternity is to come. And Jesus came to save us from our sins. Jesus came to deliver us from condemnation. Jesus came so we could become children of God. Verse 5, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The book of Romans says, Knowest thou not that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Folks, I want to tell you something. Whether you believe eternal life is a gift or not, it is a gift. Getting to heaven is a gift. It's not something you can ever earn. Somebody in their heart might think, well, if I just go to church enough times, God will owe heaven to me. Folks, God doesn't owe you anything. Well, if I just give to church, or if I get baptized, or, or if I uh, treat people right, then God owes me heaven. Folks, God doesn't owe us heaven. The Bible still says the wages of sin is death. The Bible still says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But yet God gives us the good news when it says that God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
The Bible says He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Jesus came to this earth. He lived a perfect sinless life. He didn't have a place, the Bible says, even to lay His head. Talk about the top 10%. Jesus was in the top 10%. He's the, above all the others. But He didn't even have a place to lay His head. A place to call home. But why did He come? He came to this earth to suffer on the cross for our sins. Grateful people realize that life itself and eternal life is a gift from God. Folks, Jesus loves you so much that He paid the price on the cross for your sins. He died, He rose again. And if today you'll humble your heart, you'll confess that you need a Savior, and you'll trust Jesus Christ, He'll save you today. He'll forgive you of all your sins. Not because you deserve it, but because He paid the price for you. Let's bow our heads together. Please. Hi everybody, this is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky. And I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior. And that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior... God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect, but we are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by Me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.